Everybody had fun with the counting problem set? Getting interesting now, huh? <laughs> Maybe I should make that one the first problem set of the semester, and then we wouldn't have the issue of drops, right? That would have cleared people out. Um, I did add sort of the, pretty much the remaining people from the waiting list. We are now way over enrolled. We are we are 10% over the room limit. Um, so we'll see what happens come the midterm, which is next week, right? <clears throat> One of the things that came up on the discussion board is the issue of asking questions in class. And you would be doing yourselves and me a favor by asking questions if things get confusing. And like the second you feel lost, I don't get it. What are you doing? Uh, and then we'll try to figure out exactly where the sticking point is. I think that there's, there's really a lot of value in <clears throat> being able to identify the first point at which you become lost. Um, then you can kind of focus on that. And if you kind of get washed over and uh, you know, we're four or five paragraphs or five or 10 minutes down the road, it's much more difficult to go back and, and fix it and figure out you know, where it was that you got lost and uh, find another way to say it. But <clears throat> my job is to, uh, well, to select material to present, to, to, to present things that are factually correct, but then to sort of do it in as many different ways as it takes to uh, help you get the aha or labeness, the sort of experience of, oh, I get it, um, which is what makes all this so much fun. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> it really does make it fun. <laughs> so um, you know, the sort of solving a puzzle aspect to it. The course is really about solving puzzles, not about memorizing stuff. And so. Uh, help me, help me help you. Um, let's make it a good, a good learning experience for everybody. Are there questions about anything before we go on to theories of probability? Are 10 will be on the midterm uh, because the homework is due on Friday. <clears throat> 11 will not be on the midterm. It's uh, due and whatnot afterwards. Uh, so um, midterm is Tuesday in class. I will not be here. I'm at a conference on national security in Washington, DC. Uh, I think that um, Wayne will administer the midterm. If not, I'll find another grad student to administer the midterm. Um, but I, I won't be in class for that. Um, other questions? Yes? No, you, you don't have to know how to do that. You have to be able to figure it out. <laughs> That, that, that's kind of the point of all this. Memorizing it is not going to yeah, help you do anything. All, all things, right? you, you, you should be able to, to do, I mean, if I, if I said, consider a deck of cards that has five suits, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and clovers, you know, what's the probability you get a full house, right? I, I mean, you, you need to be able to, you need to like understand it. Um, so it's not about memorizing, you know, the probability of this. It's, it's really all about strategies for solving, solving problems. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes? Yep, you can have one sheet of notes front and back, so two sides. Uh, a regular sized piece of paper, yeah. Um, no, no, no microfiche readers, scanning electron microscopes, you know, no, nothing like that. Nothing with wireless connectivity, so no cell You can't use your cell phone as a calculator, sorry. Um, you can use a, a calculator, one of the, one of the even a high-end scientific calculator like an HP or a TI, blah, 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 is fine. Um, I will trust that you're not using the calculator to store pages and pages and pages of notes. <clears throat> as I understand, some can store text, but I mean, you're allowed page notes front and back, which ought to be plenty. Um, Need to bring a Scantron form, 100 question Scantron form. I don't remember what the number of that is. It's a, sorry? 892, is that right? 882, OK. <coughs> they're the, the oblong ones that are sort of, I guess they're about as long as an, they must be 11 inches by four, something, something like that. Other questions? I'm hoping to get through this chapter today and spend Thursday entirely on review. Um, 
Okay. We've been, and we sort of started off the semester talking about data. We'll start out talking about fallacies and reasoning to just make sure we had some mental tools in our toolkit, logical tools. Then we started talking about data, kinds of data, summarizing data, displaying data. Um, and then we started talking about association, scatter plots, regression as a tool for summarizing data, what can go wrong with regression, um, how well regression summarizes data, so forth. And then we launched off in this other direction on counting. And we are using counting to introduce probability, but there's sort of probability is math. And ultimately, we want to apply what we're doing to the world. And we need some glue that ties this theoretical collection of mathematical results, this stuff that has you know, some axiomatic structure. We need some, some glue to connect that to the world. You know, when I say that the chance that a coin lands heads, a fair coin, if you toss it vigorously, the chance it lands heads is 50%, what does that mean? Right? Now, if we take it as a given that the chance is 50%, then I can go off and do all kinds of math with that. But the question is, what does it mean? What does it mean about the coin? What does it mean about the world? So we're going to talk for a little while about this philosophical glue that connects, um, th that connects the mathematical theory of probability with stuff that you can see in the world. What does it mean? What, what, how do you interpret it? So um, and the first point is that <clears throat> uh, when we say something is random or talk about having a probability of this or that, it's meant in a very technical sense. It's not the same thing as, oh, this random guy walked up to me the, today, or I heard the most random thing, or you know, whatever it is. It, it, that that's just means sort of unexpected, haphazard, whatever. Random in the sense that we're going to be talking about means something very specific. It means that something follows a particular probability law, that it has a particular probability distribution. Um, and as a result of that, it, ha it, ex it exhibits certain long-term regularities. And those, those long-term regularities are what we're going to exploit to be able to draw inferences about the world. So let's talk about what, what does it mean to say that the chance that a coin lands heads is 50%. What does that mean? Um, now, the first interpretation of that, so, so this is philosophy, right? This is, this is how do you tie math to the world? It's a piece of philosophy. It's not mathematics. It's, it's not really statistics. It's, it's, it, it's, you know, it's in this funny nether world, but we'd like to make sure that what we're saying is coherent, makes sense, and, and, and holds together. So, um, all right, so probability theory really originated in the study of quote unquote games of chance, looking at dice games, card games, things like that. And the question is somehow how should you bet or what bets are most favorable or you know how what should you do to expect to win the most money in the long run what should you do to expect to win in this particular bet so forth and so on so when you're talking about a game of chance that's really played with a mechanical source of randomness like a die or a coin or something like that you can look at the object you can inspect it you can say oh Look, this die is a perfectly symmetric cube. It has six faces. It's balanced. I don't see a little hole drilled into the side where somebody put a little piece of lead in it to make it land with one side up more often than another. You know, it, it's, it, it, there, there's really, if I throw this hard, there's no reason to think that it's going to land with one side up in preference to landing with a different side up. Okay, that somehow I can argue from symmetry that in this particular case, there's no reason that nature should prefer one outcome over another. We're interested in how many spots land on top. So there's no reason nature should prefer it to land with one spot up rather than two spots up, rather than three, four, five, or six. So I'm going to define those outcomes to be equally likely. And the probability that I will give them is each 100% divided by the number of outcomes, 100% divided by six, a sixth. All right, now just remember that percentages and fractions are the same thing. There's no difference between 50% and a half. It's the same number. So usually I'll try to talk about probabilities as percentages, but every once in a while I'll slip and talk about them as fractions. It's the same thing. All right. Um, 
OK, so according to the theory of equally likely outcomes, what it means when I say that the chance that a fair coin lands heads is 50% is that there's no reason nature would prefer the coin to land heads rather than tails. That the coin is symmetric. It looks well balanced. There are two possible outcomes. I consider those outcomes to be equally likely because there's no reason for one to be more likely than the other. And therefore, I define the probability of each to be 1 divided by the number of outcomes that there are, 1 divided by 2. 1 divided by 2 is a half, 50%. So that's, that's what I mean according to the theory of equally likely outcomes. All right, so what's wrong with that? Well, um, it leaves a lot to be desired in a lot of contexts. One is that how do you use it in a situation where you don't have symmetries to exploit? So suppose that instead of tossing a coin, I'm tossing a bent coin. Or suppose that instead of tossing a fair coin, I'm tossing a thumbtack. And I'd like to make a statement about the probability that the thumbtack lands with the point up rather than landing with the head up. Okay? I don't mean balanced on the point, I just mean you know resting with the point down. <clears throat> so how do I apply it there? Well, there's two possible outcomes, but do I really know that nature wouldn't prefer it to land with the point down versus the point up? I don't have, I, I really don't know that, right? That's, things are going to depend on how big the head is compared to how long the prong is, how the density of the material is so forth and so on. I, I really, I, I don't, I, there, there could well be a preference. So there are a lot of situations in real life where there aren't these sort of symmetries to exploit to be able to say, I really, th th that nature has no preference for one outcome over another. So this theory is then useless in those circumstances. Okay. Um, All right, there are another situation is how do you figure out which outcomes are equally likely in a situation where things are ambiguous? Suppose I'm tossing two coins. One way of thinking about this is that there are three possible outcomes. You can get both coins land heads, you can get one head and one tail, or you can get two tails. So those are three possible outcomes for tossing two identical coins. Now, according to the theory of equally likely outcomes, if there's no reason nature should prefer one of these outcomes over another, the probability of each of them should be a third. Right? Three possible outcomes, one divided by three is a third, 33 and a third percent. All right. Except that if I place bets that way, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to lose money uh, because, well, uh, actually, the probability that if you toss two identical coins, you get two heads. You know, if you look at the long run frequency of, the, of, of it getting two heads, um, if you did it over and over and over again, it would be a quarter, not a third. Okay, and we'll talk about why that is. But at any rate, if you bet as if the probability is a third, you're going you're gonna to lose money in the long run if you play the game over and over and over again. Okay, so as a theory of betting, as a way of figuring out how to bet, even there, where, this, where all this stuff came from, it's not. Uh, a completely satisfactory theory of probability. Okay. So in fact, the way out of that particular problem with equally likely outcomes is to say you take the two identical coins and you arbitrarily distinguish between the two. You think of them as being a green coin and a blue coin, or a left coin and a right coin, or a first coin and a second coin. And then you say, OK, the possible outcomes are first coin and second coin both land heads. First coin lands heads, second coin lands tails. First coin lands tails, second coin lands heads. Both coins land tails. Now we have four possible outcomes. And it turns out that if you bet as if those are equally likely, then, you have, then you'll be betting intelligently in the long run. Now, why would you think to arbitrarily label these two identical coins and pretend that they're different? I don't know. I mean, the theory of equally likely outcomes doesn't tell you how to figure out that. OK. so. Well, that, that kind of leads us to a different theory of probability, which is the frequency theory. If we're really talking about betting, one way of thinking about it is suppose I were to bet in a particular way over and over and over again in the same circumstances, what fraction of the time would I win? So if I want to bet, so um, if, I, if I bet that these two coins, when tossed, would land with, uh, with both heads up, in the long run, how, how often would I be right if I did that over and over and over again? 
So, and the answer then says, well, okay, so what does probability mean? Well, the idea is you look at how often the event occurs in repeated trials under, you know, sort of essentially identical conditions. And we'll have to talk a little bit about that because it's actually quite a, quite a big problem. So the, the idea would be you toss the pair of coins over and over and over again. Sometimes they'll land with both, both coins will land with heads up. Sometimes it'll land with one head and one tail. Sometimes it'll land both tails. You, look, you do it over and over and over again. In principle, in theory, by assumption, we'll talk about this a little bit more, the fraction of the time that it lands with both, both coins showing heads will converge to a limit. That limit is defined to be the probability that you get two heads. Okay, so it's a definition. What I mean, according to the frequency theory, what I mean by probability, the probability of event, is the, the limiting relative frequency with which the event occurs in repeated trials under essentially the same circumstances. So according to the frequency theory, what it means to say that the probability that a, coin, that a fair coin lands heads when you toss it is that if you were to do it over and over and over and over again, the fraction of the time that you, that you would get heads would settle down to a limit. That limit would be 50%. Okay? If the limit were 52%, then the probability of heads for that coin would be 52% instead of 50%. Okay, so now we've switched from kind of talking about symmetries, so forth and so on, to talking about what would happen hypothetically in repeated trials under essentially the same circumstances. Now, the fact is, if you did the trial under absolutely identical circumstances, then setting aside quantum mechanics for the moment, the coin would land the same way every time. Right? If, you, if you knock it with exactly the same initial force from exactly the same place, let it land in the same place, it's a deterministic system. It's going to land exactly the same way. Right? So we need to be a little bit careful about what we mean by, by essentially identical circumstances. So here, the idea is there's sort of enough variability in the initial conditions that you end up getting something that behaves erratically, behaves unpredictably, but in fact has long-term regularity so it settles down to a limit. All right, what's another problem with, with this theory? Well, one is, I mean, you guys, many of you have had calculus. How many have had calculus? OK, you, you, you know about limits. You know that some sequences have a limit and some sequences don't, right? So you know, here's a sequence of heads and tails. OK, so at this point, what's the relative frequency of heads? 100%, right? We've got all heads. Now, now what's the relative frequency of heads? OK. OK, now what's the relative frequency of heads? Right? OK, so I could then make a longer, longer string of tails and then a longer, longer string of heads. And the relative frequency of heads in that series would not converge, and that sequence would not converge to a limit. Right? I could make it get arbitrarily close to 0, arbitrarily close to 1, just alternating, never settle down. So the frequency theory assumes that that won't happen. It sort of says the nature of the world is that if you do repeated trials over and over again, this thing will settle down to a limit. It won't just keep alternating between you know, a big value and a small value. So that's called uh, so the, the, the empirical law of averages. It's, it's the, this, this idea, this assumption about the world that when you do things over and over like that, they do settle down to a limit. All right. Another problem with the frequency theory is that there are events that are not even, as a thought experiment, repeatable. So it's, I can't toss a coin forever. Right? I'm going to die at some point. Right? I've got to eat at some you know, whatever. So I can't do this indefinitely. The, the, the frequency theory doesn't say, once you've done it a thousand times, that's enough. Or once you've done it a million times, that's enough. Or once you've done it a billion times, that's enough. It sort of says, eventually, it settles down to a limit. You, know, you go far enough out on the tail, you're arbitrarily close to the true probability. The relative frequency is arbitrarily close to what we're calling the probability, which is that limit. All right. So even though I can't, in fact, toss a coin over and over again, I can, as a thought experiment, imagine tossing a coin over and over and over again. Well, let's talk about some other things that people like to assign probabilities to. Like, what's the chance it's going to rain tomorrow? What's the trial that gets repeated there? 
tomorrow happens once. You don't get tomorrow a whole bunch of times, right? Even, in, even as a thought experiment. Yeah? What's the probability that there's going to be an earthquake on the Hayward Fault in the year 2010, a major earthquake bigger than magnitude 7? What's the repeated trial there? You run the history of the universe from the Big Bang up until the year 2011. In some fraction of those universes, there's a solar system like ours in which there's an Earth, in which there's a California and a Hayward Fault. And in some fraction of them, the Hayward Fault has an earthquake in the year 2010. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazed, right? This is not a sensible thought experiment. You can't imagine doing that, running this over and over and over again. Nonetheless, people would like to make statements like the probability that there's an earthquake on the Hayward Fault next year is 10% or something like that. So it's, it's a problem. There are certain kinds of events that you can't assign probabilities to using the frequency theory or the, the theory of equally likely outcomes that nonetheless people want to make statements about. Or is everybody with me so far? OK. What's the chance? <coughs> I, I don't even know the names of any sports. What's, you know, what's the chance the, the, the Raiders win their next game? Right? It's like what gets repeated over and over and over again. I, I don't know. Yeah, right. um, OK. So that leads us to the third theory of probability, which is the subjective theory. The subjective theory of probability says, what I mean when I say that the chance that a coin lands heads is 50% is that I believe with equal strength that the coin will, lands heads, will land heads as I believe that it will land tails. That is, probability is a measure of how strongly I believe something will happen on a scale of 0 to 100%. So equally likely outcomes, the idea, probability is about symmetries. It's about nature being indifferent between things. Frequency theory, probability is about what would happen if I were to repeat the trial over and over again. What's the relative frequency with which the event in question would occur? Subjective theory doesn't need repeated trials. It doesn't need symmetries. It's just measuring how strongly I believe something will happen. Okay? Now, how strongly you believe something will happen and how strongly I believe that same thing will happen don't have to be the same. We each have our own probability. We each have our, our own strength of belief in some particular thing occurring. Right? That's not a problem with the theory. Right? That, that's part of sort of the definition, is that it, it, you know, I, have a, I have my subjective probability, you have yours. The difficulty with the subjective theory, and, and there are a few, um, one difficulty is that it takes probability from being something about what's outside in the world and makes it be about what's going on in my head. So for the theory of equally likely outcomes, what kind of measurements would you do to figure out whether it's equally likely for a die to land with one face showing, two faces showing, et cetera? I mean, you'd do some measurements on the die. You'd weigh the die. You'd make sure it's symmetric. You'd do something to sort of ensure that the die is fair. With the frequency theory, what would you do? You'd roll the die over and over and over again many, 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 many times and see whether one came up about a sixth of the time, and two came up about a sixth of the time, and three came up about a sixth of the time, et cetera. With a subjective theory, the measurement that I would need to do to figure out whether my subjective probability that the die lands with one spot showing really is a sixth would be psychological testing on me to make sure that that really is how strongly I believe it. Right? It's not a measurement on the world. It's not about the world. It's about my strength of belief. So it's sort of changing the subject. Normally, when we, when we talk about something like, what's the chance that it rains tomorrow, we're talking about meteorology. Right? We're talking about weather conditions, so forth and so on, not just about how strongly I believe it's going to rain tomorrow. And you know, s similar, wh why should you care how strongly I believe it's going to rain tomorrow? I mean. If I'm, if I'm a weatherman, if I'm an expert on this, so forth and so on, then maybe my probability would carry more weight than somebody else's probability. But seriously, I mean, it's sort of it's, it's me. It's not, it's not necessarily you. Yes? Is subjective theory like That would be the, 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 the most, so the question is, is, is the subjective theory what you would use to say, what's the chance the Raiders win their next game? It would be the most appropriate theory to use. So, 
um, because they don't get to play their next game over and over and over again. And there's not, like, there's two outcomes. They could win, they could lose. Do you really think that there's no reason to prefer one over the, uh, that, that nature doesn't prefer one outcome over the other? I mean, now, my strength of belief that the Raiders will win might be influenced by a bunch of things, including who I know to be on the injured list or not on the injured list, who they're playing against, what field they're on, do they do well under these conditions, is it home or away? I mean, all, all these things might enter into my degree of belief. And there are people who try to apply the frequency theory in those circumstances by sort of saying, well, other times that the Raiders have played under conditions like this, what happened? What fraction of the time did they win? It's still not really the frequency theory because it's not, you know, are, are they really sort of equivalent conditions in the same, in the same sense? I mean, you don't get to step in the same river twice, right? That's the, the old uh, philosophical saw. But um, so you might use a combination of things to establish what your personal degree of belief is, but it's still, you still can't really apply the frequency theory in that, in that circumstance. Um, there's a similar change of subject when you talk about weather forecasting. The way the statement, the chance of rain tomorrow is 30%, tends to be interpreted is what I mean when I say that is that 30% um, of the time that I say the chance is going to be 30%, there ought to be rain. So that's the sort of quasi-frequentist interpretation of a weather prediction. And how do you calibrate that? Well, you sort of look at situations. I mean, how, how, how does the meteorologist come up with a number 30% in these circumstances? Well, it's you know, sort of a black art. But it, it, you know, they're, they're looking at weather maps. They're, they're, they're correlating this and that. They're looking at what last year's weather was. They're looking at all, all kinds of things to try to come up with the prediction. But having done that, um, you don't get to repeat tomorrow and over, over and over again. So it's not really, it's not really the frequentist theory in, in, in a straightforward way. Right. So all of these theories of probability have domains where they make sense and are useful. And they all have limitations. The one that I tend to use the most often, the one that, that I find most useful for science, is the frequency theory. But it does limit me to not being able to make probability statements about certain kinds of things. For example, if you ask me, you know, what's the probability that there is going to be uh, a, an act of uh, nuclear terrorism in the United States in the year 2010, I, I would say that, that that question doesn't really make sense, that you can't really assign a probability to it. <coughs> <clears throat> you can look at all the different ways it could happen. You can try to get some gut feeling for, you know, is it easy, is it hard, this or that. But strictly speaking, in a probability sense, you can't use the frequency theory to, in, to, to interpret it because you don't get to run 2010 over and over and over again, um, or, and, or the conditions that lead up to it. So um, I kind of question when people assign numbers to things like that. The US Geological Survey has a forecast for earthquakes in the Greater Bay Area. Um, the last time I looked at it, uh, it, it was, you know, roughly a 70% chance of a magnitude 7.5 or greater earthquake in the Bay Area by the year 2030 or something like that. I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. Um, and when I looked in detail about how they actually come up with a number, it's gobbledygook. It's just a, a, an incredible mix of stuff that, you know, why anybody would be persuaded by it, I don't know. But they spent a lot of money and had a lot of smart people sitting around tables looking at data and trying to figure out what to do. Right, so what's the sensible thing from my point of view? Well, from my point of view, there's going to be a big earthquake. It's going to happen any second on a geologic time scale, which might mean today, and it might mean not in our lifetimes. Right, But because of the amount of devastation that will occur in the aftermath of a big earthquake, I think it's a sensible thing to make sure that you're if you're living in a house, it's braced and, and bolted to the foundation, and that your water tank is strapped in, and that you've got some emergency water set aside, and you know some clothes near the door, and some canned food to last you a while, and you know don't sleep under a bookcase. Um, you know they're just like sensible precautions to take uh, because the consequences are so large, and you don't need to put a number on the probability in order to do something sensible, right? In order in order to figure out what's reasonable. Now, let me raise one 
caveat about the subjective theory, a common misinterpretation is to say what it means when I say that the probability of heads is 50% is that I believe the probability of heads is 50%. What's wrong with that? Sorry? Are you asking what's wrong? What, 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 what would be wrong with a definition that says the, the, what I mean when I say the probability of, that a coin lands heads is 50%? So we, we, have, we have these various theories, right? And this one sounds very, very close to the subjective theory, but isn't. What, what's, how does it miss, and what's wrong with it as a definition? So here's the, the statement is, what I mean by saying, when I say that the probability that a coin lands heads is 50%, is that I believe that the probability that the coin lands heads is 50%. Yeah. You're just saying, I believe that the coin, the probability that the coin should land heads is 50% more likely than not landing heads? Okay, so the suggestion is I believe the probability is 50% more likely than not. This isn't. Okay. I'm trying to define probability. So I've got, if you like, I've got a left-hand side and a right-hand side. You know, the right-hand side is, the left-hand side is probability. Probability equals something or other. Should the right-hand side have probability in it? Now, I've got a circular definition if I refer to probability in my definition. Yes? So isn't it that you just say that you believe the equally likely chance of heads or tails occurring? Okay, so again, so do I believe equally likely chance of heads or tails? Again, chance and probability are synonymous, so that definition would still be saying what I mean by probability is something with probability, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't work because you haven't, y you still have this free term probability floating around, all right? So the subjective theory, so let's try to get this really sharp focus. Probability measures degree of belief that something will happen. Okay, it's not probability is belief of probability. Okay, so, pro so what probability is measuring for the coin is how strongly do I believe the coin will land heads? Do I, is the strength of my belief that it will land heads equal to the strength of my belief that it will land tails? If so, then my probability is 50%. Okay, if, if, my, if, if I believe with twice the force that it will land heads as I believe that it will land tails, then my probability of heads is two thirds. Right? Together we have two units of force and one unit of force, that's three, you know, and so I'm putting two of them on heads. Does, does this make sense? All right, so uh, the subjective theory does not define probability in terms of belief of probability, it defines probability in terms of strength of belief that something will happen. How do you figure out what somebody's strength of belief is that something will happen? This is a really, uh, it's, it's, it's an active area of research. It's been going on for some time. It's called you know, eliciting probabilities. How do you figure out whether I believe with equal strength that a coin will land heads as I believe it will land tails? Well, one way to try to get at it is to look at the bets I'd be willing to take. If I take even money on heads or tails, that's an indication that I believe with equal strength that the coin will, lands heads, will land heads as I believe it will land tails. Okay? If I take two to one odds against, then I think that one is twice as likely as the other. And one has probability two thirds, the other has probability one third. Okay. That's not a, that solution is not, <laughs> I'm trying to say that solution is fraught with complications that uh, we're not going to go into in great detail, but consider the following. <clears throat> um, I will bet you a uh, hundred million dollars that uh, there, 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 there won't be an act of nuclear terrorism in Berkeley in the year, in the year 2010. Um, if there is, I'll pay you a hundred million dollars. If there isn't, you pay me 10 bucks. Okay, does, does that mean that I believe that the probability of an act of nuclear terrorism is that small, relatively speaking? 
Well, it might, or it might just be that I'm going like, if it happens, I'm not going to have to pay off, am I? <laughs> right? Okay, so there's sort of a, uh, right, there, there's, a, there's a utility aspect, right? The, the consequences can affect the utility of the money, right? So what I'm willing to bet doesn't necessarily reflect my strength of belief in, in something occurring or not occurring. Um, there's another problem as well, which is the nonlinearity of money. Um, if, if people were behaving, if, if people were entering lotteries, sweepstakes, and things like that, according to whether they actually expected to make money in a probabilistic sense, whether, whether, whether you have a, a positive expected return, then it's crazy to ever enter any of these things. Okay? Because you're expecting, you know, if, if, if you sort of know that like 50, 50 cents on the dollar comes back in prize money, so the overall expected return is less than 50%. Right? You, you're not, you're not going to, OK. But what's the calculation that people are doing mentally? Well, for many people, it's something like this. I'm not going to notice the loss of the dollar I spent playing lotto. It's not a consequential sum of money to me. But I will notice $10 million if I win. And so even though I don't think the odds are that I would, I don't expect to get I expect to lose money, right? I, I expect to lose money. It might still be rational to place the bet because you don't care about the dollar, but you really do care about the 10 million. Does, does that make sense? So the bet you're willing to take might not reflect what you think the real odds are. Th this kind of thing can happen if you look at, I think this example, roughly speaking, is from the book by Shamat Wong on, um, uh, no, no uh, Can't remember is how to tell the liars from the statisticians. It's not it's not how to lie with statistics. It's a different book. I can't remember the author's name right now. Um, but it, it's it's the following. So suppose that um, I'm out drilling for oil and I'm making up these numbers. So I, I don't I don't know what it is. But let, let's suppose that it, it's going to cost me a million bucks to drill an oil well, and that I only have you know something like a 10% chance of finding oil. You know, if I do find oil, um, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll make uh, uh, twenty million dollars or something like that. But if I don't, I won't. You know, I won't make anything. I'll just lose my money. Okay, so it's it's a very different situation to like scrimp, save, pull together a whole bunch of people to come up with enough money to drill one oil well when you still only have a relatively small chance of getting your money back, and then perhaps more. It's a different calculation from if you have a large oil company that can afford to go out and drill 100 oil wells and be you know, virtually guaranteed that some of them are going to come back with oil and they're going to do better than break even. D d does that make sense? OK, so it's kind of a single long shot is, is a different story from a bunch of long shots that, 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 that you know, give you some high probability of a positive return, as opposed to simply an expected positive return. OK, everybody's glazed. Yes? OK, so if, if I am indifferent between two bets, so if I'm indifferent between a bet where uh, if the coin lands heads, I, 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 I get a dollar. If the coin lands tails, I lose a dollar. And this other bet, if the coin lands tails, I win a dollar. If the coin lands tails, I, uh, if the coin doesn't land tails, I lose a dollar. If I'm indifferent between those two, then, I assign, then what that means is I have the same strength of belief that they will both happen. And so my pr the probabilities are the same. OK. Now, except that we just said it's not really that simple. Um, in an idealized situation, it would be that simple. But in fact, I can be indifferent between two bets um, and, and for other reasons other, other than my strength of belief. No, another question? 
Why don't we take a quick break, and then we'll, we'll talk about some examples. And they're off. OK, so this is really just trying to get the concepts and the language clear. <clears throat> like what we were talking about a moment ago, why can't I? Why is it not a valid definition of anything to say what I mean by the probability is 50% is that I believe the probability is 50%? Well, I believe that what is 50%? I haven't defined probability, so I, I can't define it in terms of itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about getting you know the language precise. So let's let's look at exa an example. Standardized six faces, you know, one to six spots. According to the frequency theory, what does it mean to say that the chance that the die lands with one, one spot showing is a sixth. OK. Does it mean that a one will show in one out of six rolls? No. Uh, does it mean that a one will show in 1,000 out of 6,000 rolls? No. Uh, it, 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 what it means is that if I do it over and over and over again, in the limit, the fraction of rolls that show a one will converge to a sixth. Okay, so it's not going to be exactly a sixth, except occasionally. But it's going to get, but, but it's going to get closer and closer and closer to a sixth the further you go on. At some point. All right. According to the frequency, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Robin Williams has rented lips. Um, According to the theory of equally likely outcomes, what it means to say the chance is a six that a, a die lands with uh, one spot showing is what? OK. We're liking, there's no reason nature should prefer. There's six outcomes, so they all have the same probability, one sixth. The die is symmetrical. OK. All right, so there's some reasoning about reasoning from the symmetry. The symmetry is sort of my evidence that there's no reason nature should prefer one outcome over another. Okay, It's not enough for there to be six outcomes. The six outcomes somehow have to, we have to have a reason for judging them to be equally likely. right? So the example of the thumbtack is like that. Two possible outcomes, point up, point down. That doesn't mean that, they, that they're equally likely. <clears throat> even according to the theory of equally likely outcomes. According to the subjective theory, what do I mean when I say that the chance the die lands with one spot showing is a sixth? B? D. D like dog. We like D like dog. OK, so it's a measure of how strongly I believe it will happen in the very next roll. Right? It's not a statement about what's going to happen in the long run if I do it over and over again. What are the problems with these things? So this is, this is a statement about what I believe the relative frequency will be. That's different. OK? This is a statement, uh, thinks the chance a 1 will show is a 6. I've now defined probability in terms of probability. It's the same problem. That doesn't work. Um, this is sort of some amalgamation between the frequency theory and the subjective theory. It's not the subjective theory. OK. Um, all right. Now, um, according to the theory of equally likely outcomes, 
If I then want to look at something that isn't a simple outcome, but that is a combination of simple outcomes. So the simple outcomes for rolling a die are lands with one spot showing, or two, or three, or four, or five, or six. Well, how do I figure out the chance that it lands with fewer than five spots showing? I, I add the chances of the simple outcomes that are in that set, that are in that event. We'll talk about events a lot more later. But um, fewer than five spots means showing one, two, three, or four. That's four of the six outcomes. They're, the outcomes are supposedly equally likely. That's the assumption. So the chance is four sixths, two thirds, 66.6%. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, what theory of probability would be most natural to use to make statements about the probability of a team winning a particular sports event? Subjective, Subjective theory. Right. Very difficult to run things over and over and over again. All right, uh, let's do this exercise 10-6. Um, all right, so this, in this, hypo, this lotto game, and I don't actually know if it corresponds to California lotto right now or not. Does anybody, does anybody play lotto? See, it, my, my, my uh, this, is, this is really rude and and I'm getting videoed, so it's here for posterity. But um, my, my, my joke about the lottery is that it, it's sort of, you know, it's an educational tax. It taxes the people who need the education. That's sort of that. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, OK. Um, in this particular hypothetical lotto game, uh, you pick six numbers between 1 and 53. Then there's a big hopper with balls that are stirred up in such a way that you know, balls are pulled out of it in such a way that every subset of six of the 53 balls is equally likely. Okay, so the idea is because they're stirred together mechanically, this is all they're popped out by air, whatever it is that's happening to, to make the lotto balls come out. It's supposed to be done in such a way that there's no reason that you would get one set of six balls over some other set of six of the 53 balls. All right, so in that situation, every set of six of the 53 balls is equally likely by, by construction, by fiat. All right, so how many possible outcomes are there of getting six balls? Well, from the 53, you choose six. It's about 22 million, almost 23 million possible outcomes. What's the chance that if you play once, you win the jackpot? Well, it's, you, you pick one particular set of six numbers. There's a 1 over 22.9 million chance that you will pick the six numbers that end up getting drawn by the machine, okay? assuming that you don't have ESP or something that would let you, you know, predict the future. Right? OK, so it's, it's, a, it's a very small number. Now, this is fun. I've actually been on radio and TV talking about the law. When the lottery jackpot gets sufficiently high, the, the, the news companies start making phone calls to statisticians um, to say, what are the chances? How can I improve my chances? Oh, OK. So uh, how many of you have thought about the lottery at all? This is just a, yeah, a little bit. OK. So it, is there a way of picking the numbers that is going to improve your chances of winning? If everything's fair, the answer is no, right? It, it doesn't, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're, they're sort of, by definition, aren't lucky numbers. Now, th some, some years ago, there was an Australian consortium that uh, got together when the, when the lottery uh, value got sufficiently high, right? If there's, if there's like 23 million different winning numbers, then if the jackpot gets to be, for the sake of argument, $50 million. If you buy one of every ticket, you're going to make something like 30 million bucks, right? You know, you'll spend 23 million to buy one of every ticket, but you're going to get an extra 30 million back, right? With one problem. What if you're not the only person to get the winning combination and you end up having to share the prize? 
Okay? So if you end up having to share the prize with somebody, you've now cut the winnings in half. You'd still have a profit under this particular scenario. Right? So again, this is like that oil well example, where it's kind of silly to bet once, but if you can bet, <laughs> if you can bet enough, you can turn it into a sure thing in, in, in some sense. All right, so you can't manipulate your chance of winning with a single set of numbers, but what you can do is actually uh, influence your, your chance of sort of having to share if you do win. And to do this, you need to know a little bit about human behavior, which is that what's sort of the most common thing for people to pick for lottery numbers? Seven? I'm sure seven is a popular choice, but there, there, how do, where do people, other than from fortune cookies, what do people look at? Yeah. Uh, maybe like, uh, like the jersey numbers or birthdays or uh, like numbers. Jersey numbers, birthdays, lucky numbers. So birthdays are actually really common, okay? So if you're picking a birthday or your kid's birthday or your favorite relative's birthday or whatever it is, you're not going to see any numbers bigger than 31. Right? So if when you play the lottery, you pick only numbers that are bigger than 31, if you win, you're not going to have to share with anybody who picked a birthday. Does that make sense? OK, so you, you, know, you can't manipulate your chance of winning, but to some extent, you can do something to influence your chance of having to share if you do win. All right. <clears throat> um, all right. So in this hypothetical lottery, uh, you know, you're, you're picking six out of 53 numbers. There's a payoff of five bucks if you match three of the six numbers. Um, how can we figure out what the chance is of matching three of the six? Well, th this, th this logic that we are about to do on the board happens over and over and over again. It's just this is, this is a really important time to focus. To, to match three of the numbers, the, the draw, the, 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 computer, the, uh, the machine's production of these six numbers has to end up with three of the six numbers you picked and, 47, uh, and, and three of the 47 numbers that you didn't pick. Right? Six plus 47 is 53. So what has to happen is from you pick six numbers, let's say you pick um, um, one, two, three, four, five, um, six. Okay? And the numbers that you didn't pick are the other 47 numbers between 1 and 53. So we have here 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, et cetera, on up to 53. So this, there's 47 of those, and there, here there's 6. So in order for you to match exactly three of the numbers that the lottery machine generates, the lottery machine has to draw three of yours and three of those, right? How many ways can that happen? We can view this as a sequence of steps, a sequence of choices, where first the machine picks three of the numbers that aren't yours, and then the machine picks three of the numbers that are yours. How many ways are there of picking three of the numbers that aren't yours? OK. 47 choose 3. For each of those, no matter which three of those numbers you get, there's a bunch of ways of picking three of these numbers. How many ways are there of picking three of these numbers? OK. Now, do I add these? Do I multiply them? What do I do to find out the total number of ways there are of getting three of those and three of those? And multiply them. OK. Because this is like a, it's a sequence of choices. No matter which three I get, there's this many of those. So if I drew a tree, each branch of the first tree would then have this many branches below. Each, each of the first branches would have this many branches below. 
Okay. So there's that many ways of doing it. Each of these ways of pulling three of those and three of those is equally likely by assumption. Okay. What is the chance of each of them? The chance of getting any particular six numbers in the lottery, we just figured out how many ways are the, how many ways are there for it to happen? Okay, there are this many things that could happen in all. They're equally likely. This many of them result in our matching three. Okay. So the probability that, that we match three is this ratio. It's, it's not a big number, but it's a whole lot bigger than that number. <clears throat> All right. How many ways are there to match five of the winning numbers? Okay, I'm hearing I'm, I'm hearing the right answer. Okay, so in order to match five of the numbers, the machine has to draw one number that isn't yours and five numbers that are yours. There's 47 choose one ways of picking the number that isn't yours, which is 47. But I'll write it that way anyway. And for each for each number that you get over here, there's six choose five ways of picking five of your numbers to match. Okay, And there's still this many things that could happen in all, and they're all equally likely sort of by construction, by hypothesis, by, by whatever. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so that's the number of ways it can happen. That's the probability, because they're all equally likely. That's how many things that could happen, could happen in all. All right. Um, let's do this, which will get us back to card hands, which everybody has enjoyed so much last time. I was actually pretty pleased with the lecture to be able to like, end with the last hand as the bell sounded. That was, I was uh, feeling on top of my game, as it were. Um, OK, so uh, let's suppose that aces can be high or low. Um, so you've got uh, th that. So ace two three four five is a straight, and so is ten jack queen king ace. Okay, that piece of information is sort of irrelevant for the question that's about to be asked. But there's some versions of the question when you reload the page where it matters. It doesn't matter for this one, so don't be distracted. Uh, the number of ways of getting a five card hand that is four of a kind from a standard deck, deck of cards is question mark. We did that last time. We'll do it again. And the probability of being dealt a five card hand that's four of a kind from well shuffled deck of cards is, and that's, that's the new piece this time. So if we shuffle a deck of cards well, what do we mean for the deck to be well shuffled? Okay, it, it it's, means that it's in an order that's random. And in particular, every possible ordering of the deck is equally likely. That's what we mean by well shuffled. Okay? that it's just as likely to be ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king of spades, followed by ace, two, three, four, well, of hearts, followed by, as it is to be seven of diamonds, followed by two of clubs, followed by three of hearts, followed by whatever, right? They're all, every permutation of the 52 cards is equally likely after shuffling. How many permutations are there of 52 cards? How many orderings are there? 52 factorial. This is... This, this meets the definition of ginormous number. Right? It's big. OK. <clears throat> all right. Um, OK, so first of all, how many ways are there of getting four of a kind uh, in a five card hand from a standard deck of cards? OK, let, we'll do this a slightly different way from what we did last time and see if, it, if this way of approaching it makes more sense to some people. We're going to look at a particular hand that is, five, that is four of a kind and then 
see what we could have done differently in order to see how many other four of a kind hands we might have gotten. So let's look at ace of spades, ace of hearts, ace of diamonds, ace of clubs, king of spades. Now there's a really nice four of a kind hand. Okay. Now, how do I generalize this? What could I have done differently? Well, th this card, after I've taken out the, the four aces, there are 52 cards in a deck. Four of them are aces. 48 of them are something else. Any of those 48 cards could have been here, right? So I have 48 possible choices for this. this. This place could have been any of 48 things. OK. Um, that's for a particular choice here. But this choice didn't have to be the aces. Instead of getting the four aces, I could have gotten four twos. I could have gotten four threes. I could have gotten four sevens, whatever. Does this make sense? Okay. How many different things could I have done here? There, there are 13 different kinds of cards in the deck. So I could have done that in 13 other ways, 13 ways in all, in, including this way. Right. For each way, no matter what I pick to have four of a kind of, I have 48 choices for the odd card. Yep. So the total number of ways that I could do this is that, just 13 times 48. Does this make sense? Is it right? Have I misled you? Have I pulled one over on you? By four? Where were the four what? For, for, for getting the four aces? OK, so that's a, that's a good question. So why isn't there something to do with the fact that there's four here? The, the, the answer is, um, Having picked that I'm getting aces, there's only one subset of aces I can get that gives me four, namely all of them. So there's, if you like, there's a, there's a four choose four factor. So four choose four is one. So that, that, that's what's going on. Yes? You have to take into account the suit of the extra card? OK, do I have to take into account the suit? So this. The answer is yes and no. There are two ways of doing it. This way of doing it, I'm just saying any of the remaining 48 cards would work. OK. okay. A different way of doing this would be to say, well, OK, um, instead of getting the king of spades, I might have gotten a different king. OK. And in fact, there are sort of four other suits I could have gotten of the king. But I didn't have to get kings. I could have gotten any of the cards that aren't aces. There's 12 ways I could have done that. And this is still 48. So it's, it's a different way of doing, solving the same problem. There's always more than one way to solve these problems. Right. There's even more than one right way. <laughs> so, uh, other questions about this? OK, so if, if 13 times 48 is the number of five card hands that are four of a kind, what's the probability that I, that I am dealt four of a kind out of a well shuffled deck of 52 cards? Yeah. OK, what am I going to divide this by? OK, so there's 52 choose five five card hands that I can get. Now again, the scenario here is I am dealt five cards. I pick them up. It's a set of five cards. right? It doesn't matter what order they were dealt to me. And what matters is that those are the five cards I got. Okay, so That's why we're looking at sets of five of the 52. Does this make sense? OK. Um, all right. We've got about 10 minutes left today. I don't particularly want to start anything new. We could start reviewing. We could go back and we could, we could hit. If the card hand stuff was 
puzzling for people. If you want me to talk about one of the homework problems from last night, I can do that. Yes. The, the 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 necklace or DNA chain problem? Is that? Yep. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the DNA. Um, all right. So in this cartoon, we have four bases that DNA is built out of, and we're just representing them by their first letters A, T, G, and C. Um, and if you, you, you string, I mean, um, I'm going to quickly get in over my head because I don't remember the biology that I took once upon a time very well. But my recollection is uh, DNA is double stranded, A bonds with T, G bonds with C. Is this right? Yeah? OK. All right, so if I had something that looked like this, then the other strand would be complementary to this, like that. And you know, in the process of well, when it's active, when it's replicating, whatever, the two strands get unzipped, and one of them gets replicated. But when we're thinking about one strand, not the double strand, and because this is just sort of a, a, a molecule in solution, um, absent some other information, I can't tell whether to read this left to right or right to left. Right? That sort of it can spin around, right? It's not, it doesn't have, an, it, 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 it doesn't know left from right in, in this cartoon. There are ways that cells actually know which end to start at, but that's a different story. This is a little cartoon. <clears throat> okay, so what I'd like to know, I just happen to have written this down with six base pairs, so let's do six. Six bases, so let's do six. How many different strings can I make if those are the rules? So one's things, how many different things can I make that you can tell apart? So there's one of them. Now, I can't tell this one from, th th this is the same string as A, C, T, G, G, A. Because that's just flipped around. And, there's, and I'm, I'm claiming in this cartoon that there's no difference between them because you can get one from the other by flipping them around. So how many different, how many distinguishable strings are there? OK, so th 4 to the 6th has been volunteered. Let's, let's look at what 4 to the 6th does. So in the four, 4 to the 6th is a very good starting point, but it, it's over counting. Some, things, some strands are being counted more than once. And let's figure out how many of them there are and what to do about it. So if I take 4 to the 6th, that's saying I've got six places. And any of these six places can have any of the four bases. All right. So if I could tell left from right, that would be the answer, It'd just be 4 to the 6th. But I'm claiming that I can't tell left from right. And so in particular, if I count 4 to the 6th, I've counted this and I've counted this as if they are different. But they're not. They're the same. OK? So the single piece of DNA that looks like this has actually been counted once this way and once this way. It's been counted twice. So which strands get counted? Does every, does every sequence get counted twice? No, some of them don't. I mean, for example, how about this one? Okay, this looks the same whether you read it right to left or left to right. Left to right. So this particular sequence really does you know, th that corresponds to one piece of DNA, and there's no other one in the list that corresponds to the same piece. Yes. So is it just like either forward or backward, or is it, can it start with like in the middle of that sequence and wrap around? Okay, so the question is, can it start in the middle and wrap around? So I'm I'm envisioning this as being a little string, not as being a loop. So it's this is just forwards or backwards. It, it can't tell right from left. It can tell the middle from an end. OK. All right, so this gets counted once, but this gets counted twice if I'm counting in, in the 4 to the 6. In the list of 4 to the 6 possibilities, 
this really is, th th this, this sequence corresponds, is the only one that corresponds to this piece of DNA, whereas there's a piece of DNA that's listed twice because it's listed in both orders. So basically, things that are symmetric, things that look the same left to right as right to left, get counted once. Things that are asymmetric get counted twice. Does that make sense? OK, so another name for, word for something that, that's symmetric like this is a palindrome. You've people with palindromes. There's madam, I'm Adam. So sentences, if you read them forwards and backwards, they're the same. There's this wonderful book of palindromes that's Um, OK, uh, all right, so what we need to know is how many palindromes there are and how many non-palindromes, because the palindromes are counted once and the non-palindromes are counted twice. How do you make a palindrome? Yeah, you, you, you get to, in this scenario, you get to specify the first three bases, and that determines what the last ones are. They just have to be these in backwards order, right? So I get to, to specify this, just like specifying a hand, I specify what suits of what cards. Here I get to specify, I get to pick freely what the first three bases are. And having done that, the other three are determined if it's going to be a palindrome. So how many palindromes are there? I have four to the third choices for these first three. Four choices for that, times four for that, times four for that. Having done it, the remaining ones are fixed. OK, so I, there's four cubed palindromes. All right, so how many non-palindromes are there? Yeah, it must be everything else, right? So there's. 4 to the 6th minus 4 cubed non-palindromes. OK. So the non-palindromes sort of occur twice, and these occur once. So how many things are there in all? OK, so there's. 4 cubed plus a half of 4 to the 6th minus 4 cubed, right? So can, suppose I have this story. What can I put there and have it still be a palindrome? Anything. So in this scenario, I get to pick all four of these. And then provided I make the last three match the first three, I've got a palindrome. So how many choices do I have for how many palindromes are there in these sequences of length 7? Right, you get, there's, there's, I can put any of the four bases in any of the four places. Having done that, the last three are determined. Other questions? Yes. Sorry? Finish this? OK. Uh, so let's put uh, a G here just for grins. So there's this many palindromes. There's 4 to the 7th minus 4 to the 4th non-palindromes. And so the total number of distinguishable sequences is 4 to the 4th plus a half of 4 to the 7th minus 4 to the 4th. And if you do the algebra, um, this is basically 4 to the 7th plus 4 to the 4th over 2, right? You've, you've taken one of these minus a half of it. There's a half of it. 
Now I just need to worry about the fact that this webcast will be available to people taking the course before the homework is due next year. So um, hmm. <laughs> they, won't, they won't read ahead. They won't go. No, nobody will. Okay, great. All right. Okay. Um, I'll see you guys on Thursday. We'll do review for the for the midterm.